Ah, welcome back, my friends. It's good to see you again. You're tuned into the San Francisco Conservatory of Music's Tiny Dorm Concert Series. I'm Jonas Wright, Dean and Chief Academic Officer. For those of you joining us for the first time this afternoon, uh, our Tiny Dorm Series is a selection of student, you know, sometimes faculty and alumni, broadcasting short or shall we say tiny performances from their home and oftentimes their dorm. We're so glad you tuned in today. We have a special program this afternoon, not quite uh, concert performances, but rather scenes and monologues from the acting class. Um, if you like what you see and you're watching on YouTube, be sure to comment in the chat box. I know our students really appreciate it and it's great to give them feedback. A couple of thanks. I'd like to start by thanking Harry Winston for their longstanding commitment to SFCM. If you um, are interested, I would encourage you to go online and take a look at the collection there. And then when we're moving around the city, go back into the salon in Union Square. It's a great place and friendly folks. Also like to thank all of you out there, the donors and supporters of ours. If you can manage it, um, we would encourage you to go to the sfcm.edu website, look for the giving button and make a donation to our scholarship fund. 99% of our students receive scholarship and it's from supporters like you that were able to do that. Today, for today's program, I'm going to be joined by Melissa Carey, who is our professor of acting here at the conservatory. While we don't have a acting degree, we do have a lot of coursework that we offer our students in preparation for their studies. Melissa is going to be introducing each scene and, and performer and tell us a little bit about it. I'm going to join her at the halfway point and then see you all again at the end. Let's see, Melissa, are you out there? Ah, there you are. Hello. Hello. So happy to be here today and to be able to share this exciting work, this exciting aspect of the some of the classwork that we get to offer in the opera and the musical theater program. Um, you know, the singers have got to learn many skills besides just their beautiful singing and musicianship. And so that's what we'll be showing today is the kind of work they do in support of preparing them to go out and begin auditioning for young artists programs or careers of, of some sort. Well, I'm really excited about today's program. Melissa, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll see you in about 30 minutes. Great. Okay. Let's raise the curtain on our first scene. It's a classic farce called Lend Me a Tenor by Ken Ludwig. The role of Max will be played by Kyle Tingson, and Maggie will be played by Mackenzie Jackman. The year is 1934. It is opening night of an opera. Max is an assistant to the producer of the opera, and he is panicking because the lead tenor is nowhere to be found. His girlfriend, Maggie, isn't worried, and Max is in for a surprise. Sir! Sir! He's gonna kill me. He will not. He'd have nobody to yell at. At least nobody who takes it the way that you do. Maggie, the man is two hours late. The rehearsal starts in 10 minutes. He'll be here, Max. This is Tito Morelli. He's a genius. They just don't think like other people. So what are you saying? He's a grown man who can't tell time? I'm just not worried, okay? Oh, Max, just think of it. Tonight, the curtain rises, and he walks on stage, and suddenly, there's nothing else in the world but that, that voice. I can sing too, you know. <laughs> oh, Max. I, I can. What are you? <laughs> oh, Max. You don't sing like Pito Marelli. Not yet, okay? You don't. In your opinion, it's a matter of taste. It is not. I wish you wouldn't fool yourself. He's a star, Max. He sings all over the world. He's in Life magazine. <laughs> so is Rin Tin Tin. And he's very sensitive. How do you know that? Because I met him last year. You did? You never told me that. It was no big thing. When I was in Italy with Daddy, we went to La Scala and he was an Aida. And then afterwards, we went backstage and, well, there he was, all by himself behind the curtain. He was wearing a sort of loincloth, and his whole body was pouring with sweat. Anyway, he looked up at us, and do you know what he did, Max? 
He kissed my palms! Yeah? So what? It was romantic. He's Italian. They kiss everything. Fine, forget it. If it moves, they kiss it. Max! So what else happened? Nothing. Of any importance. Something else happened? Mm, not really. Something sort of happened. It wasn't important. What happened? It was nothing! Oh, I... I fainted. You fainted? It must have been from the heat and all the excitement. I remember thinking, my god, it's like an oven back here. And he looked up at us, and we were talking, and, and I blacked out! <laughs> oh, great. I mean, this is terrific. My fiancé meets this, this sweaty Italian guy and she kneels over. From the heat. And I'm not your fiancé, Max. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did I ask you to marry me or not, huh? Remember that? What did you... You blacked out during the proposal? I heard it, Max. And I said no. You said you'd think about it. <sighs> Max, I'm just not ready yet. I want something special first. Something wonderful and romantic. I'm not romantic? I don't believe this. What do you call a rowboat at 3 a.m., huh? Moonlight shimmering on the water. Nobody for miles. You lost the oars. It was fun. It turned out fun. We spent 30 hours in a rowboat, Max. That's not the point! Ugh. I haven't had any flings, Max. Flings? Flings! Flings. I asked you to fling with me for three years. I begged you. I don't mean that. I just feel that I need some wider experience. <sighs> oh, sure, sure. I get it. You mean like Diana? Diana? Desdemona, soprano. Oh, her. She's flinging her way through the whole cast. All the men are getting flung out. You should see the guy who plays Iago. He's supposed to be evil. <laughs> he can hardly walk. Max! He's limping now. <laughs> Max! Listen, let's be honest. When you kiss me, do you hear anything special? Like what? Like bells. You want to hear bells? I guess it sounds stupid, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Just forget it! Okay, terrific, you two. Thank you so much. Great start. Okay, our next scene is from a play called LMNOP by Molly Smith Metzler from 2011. Simone is played by Leora Gilger, and Devin is played by Celine Regalet, who is coming to us today from Istanbul. Yup. Here we have two sisters who grew up in a very blue collar, upstate New York. Simone has invited Devin down to the Hamptons to celebrate her new fabulous job. Oh my God, she did way too much. Look at this. Simone. What the hell was that? The guy hates your ass. Who? Him? He just has an attitude. Look, she got you a black dog sweatshirt. Oh, that's gonna look so cute on you. Now smile and give me a thumbs up so I can text her a thank you so much love it pic from my berry. Your berry? No. You know what? No. Let's do a video instead. Look over here and say, thanks, Michaela, and wave. Absolutely not. Say... Thanks, Michaela. Your home is lovely. Thanks for having me in for my plane ticket. Well, gee, hi, and thanks, Michaela, for paying for all of my transportation this weekend, which is not humiliating at all. Also, a special thanks for that ginormous black dot sweatshirt. A black lab actually bit me in the face in fifth grade, so I can't tell you how excited I am to be wearing his doppelganger here on my chest. P.S. Get a job. Yay, I'll just... Send it without sound. That'll make her day. She's been a little depressed lately this week, you know, Labor Day itself, time passing, kids going back to school, sands through the hourglass. It's been a tough year for Michaela. 
Oh no, really? This rich bitch has problems. Disco, please, everybody hurts my rem. You know, Devin, I think you should really try to have a little more perspective about people. Should I? Yeah, that's the biggest thing I've learned this year with this job is that we should all try to have more empathy for each other because there's more to people than meets the eye, Devin. That's all I'm gonna say. No, keep going, Obi-Wan. Why should I have empathy for this lady? Never mind, I didn't mean to get into this. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Look, it's just, the thing about her is that she just gives and gives and she's been so good to me this year. Yeah, you keep saying that, that she's so good to you. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. She's generous and nice and we're sort of friends. You're sort of her employee, Simone. See, this is why I don't tell you things, Devin. God, because you become an interrogating freak and you get crazy eyes and everything becomes suspicious. I think it is suspicious that Jose calls her the Wicked Witch and you can't seem to give me one real non-vague example of how she's... She taught me how to play tennis. She read my 590-page novel, Devin. I've read your novel, Simone. I just haven't a chance to tell you that I did. Yeah? What's the title? Well, <laughs> whatever. What does your new BFF pay you, huh? Because that's the true test of friendship. That's a very impolite question, Devin. That's a very impolite question, Devin. Oh, girl, you're from Buffalo. I've seen you tailgating with a Boone's Food Punch, rocking your Puffy Bill starter jacket. She pays me generously, okay? Oh, I want to figure. 20? 25? 30? 40? 50? You do not make it F 50 F and K do to rich lady and to babysit with her no kids. Are you kidding me? 51? 52? 53? I make $104,000 a year, plus benefits, clothing, allowance, room, board, and she paid off my student loans. Simone, what? Why in God's name would anyone pay off your student loans? I'm going to be paying off my MSW until 2065. Maybe that's what I'm worth. That's your worth? According to who? I'll tell you whom. My placement service. Ivy League degree. Bilingual. I know HTML, Outlook, and QuickBooks. I type 120 words in a minute with 90% accuracy. I am attractive. Um, I'm able to... You're attractive? Did you just say that? So, it's a fact that when you're paid to be someone's public representative, like an executive assistant, being attractive ups your base salary. You're 27, Simone. You're supposed to be hitchhiking, seeing the world, having fun, sleeping with people named Skip, not making money is because you're attractive. I'm 29, Devin. Look, I have empathy and perspective about everything you've been through, okay? I'm sorry that you screwed the pooch with California, but that doesn't mean you get to show up here with your crazy eyes and poop all over my great gig, especially when I have been so there for you this year. There for me? I'm back at mom's house. I'm down by the river here and I haven't seen you in six months. Don't you give a shit about what's going on with me? Yes, I do. Of course I do, Devin. That's why I brought you out here for a really fun B day weekend. Well, my F and B day was three months ago and you didn't bother to show. Well, excuse me for wanting to share my beachfront success with you. Sell out? You immature, jealous brat! Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> okay, ladies, good. Thank you. Oh, sisters. Ah, oh, good. Thank you very much. All right. In our next contemporary dark comedy called The Smell of the Kill, we meet Deborah, played by Mad Madison Rosler, and Nikki, played by Kaylee Milterson. At a regular monthly dinner party, which happens because the husbands are more friends than the wives, we find these two women in conversation. Nikki has just found out that her husband has been running up debts that they cannot pay. Deborah, being Deborah, has a solution. I thought you said you didn't have any money. We 
Don't. Jay just bought a meat locker. How much did that cost? Ask American Express. What's the matter with you? My husband just bought an $8,000 meat locker. We don't have that money. You will when you quit your job. I'm not quitting my job. Jay needs you. Jay needs cash. <laughs> what difference does it make? Big difference. He's your husband. For the moment. Uh, you wouldn't leave Jay. No, no, I couldn't leave Jay. Good. Because everything we have is in his name. Well, that was stupid. Yes, it was. Look, every couple has their problems. They argue, they say awful things. Sometimes they don't see each other for a while to let things cool down. Is that what you and Marty do? <laughs> we don't fight. Oh, come on, Deborah. Why would I fight with Marty? Everybody fights. I'm not like you. I don't have your... Ugh. What? Never mind. What? What do I have? You're always so... Oof. What? I hear you sometimes and I watch these things fly right out of your mouth. You mean spit? No. No, I mean sparks. Sparks? Yes. I speak in sparks? Yes. Do you? Have the spark thing? Yeah. No. No! <laughs> what do you have? We're not talking about me. We could talk about you. If you need money so badly, sell the house. Deborah, we had the house appraised. We would lose our shirts if we sold it now. Who appraised it? Some guy in the neighborhood. Marty would have done that for you. I know. You could have called. It was a fluke. The guy rang our bell. Why didn't you call Marty? I told you. We didn't plan it or anything. Then how do you know he did it right? It's not that involved. Sure it is. It is involved. It's a science. And Marty is a genius at it. He's won awards for his appraisals. You should have called Marty. <sighs> the point is, we're not selling the house. Well, then you'll have to quit. It doesn't sound like you have a choice. Oh, as long as I've got a mouth, I've got a choice. I think it's a good thing we're not getting together next month. You bet. Not that I ever minded cooking. Well, if you ever cooked, you'd mind. I cook. Oh, yes. You make that soup. Cauliflower. Homemade. From scratch. From a can. That's a lie. Truth. I make that soup from scratch. You make that soup from cans. You're wrong. I made that soup last week. It's one of Marty's favorites. Don't worry. I haven't told anyone. There is nothing to tell. <sighs> and that jello mold of yours. What about it? You buy it. That takes me two and a half hours to assemble. <sighs> you go to Hanson's in Glencoe. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, that mandarin orange, cream cheese, slime lime, jello mold. I think Hansen's got a recipe from a 1929 good housekeeper. That's my jello mold. I've seen you leave the store with it. <laughs> what do you do? Spy on me? Debra, you're not that interesting. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Fantastic. Terrific. Okay. For those of you just joining us today uh, at today's Tiny Dorm concert, I want to welcome you to the theatrical fun. We're doing scenes from the opera department acting class. Uh, and I'm Melissa Carey and get to co-host today along with Dean Jonas Wright. 
Now, for a slight change of pace, Will O'Brien, who is Zooming today from Christ Church, New Zealand, will be doing Lawrence's monologue from Full Circle by S.W. Senek. I think he's about here. Uh, Lawrence? Look, I don't mean to bother you, it's just... Well, if we should ever date, I just want you to know that I hate ramblers. <laughs> I've been on too many dates that just go on and on about nothing. And not me, though. No, that's one thing you'll notice right away. I don't ramble. I can control myself. I'm in complete control of this hair vehicle. <laughs> oh, yes, from point A to point... The B. Uh, and speaking of point A to point B, I couldn't help but notice how cold it was when walking here. <laughs> Unquestionably cold. <sighs> Did you ever go about your day, stop in the middle of your lunch hour while eating pastrami on rye, and think to yourself, Duh, I wore the wrong shoes today. Uh, I, I have four pairs of shoes, actually. Uh, two pairs of sneakers, one brand spanking new brown dress shoe, and lastly, the New York black casual shoe, perfect for any occasion. Oh, the only problem with my black casual, though, is that there's this massive hole on the left heel. <laughs> I can't toss it, though. It's, it's been too much emotion invested. And besides, when I was putting it on this morning, the weatherman said the forecast was bone dry. <laughs> bone dry? Where'd they get that saying, huh? Bone dry. Anyway, before you know it, slush soaps up into my black dress sock, and I spend the rest of my outdoor afternoon experiences limping. And I'm between the limping and the holiday bell ringers ringing in your ear. The point is, for like the next 20 minutes, there's this reverberation in your head. And like, I like holidays, okay? I, I just think there are too many of them. I mean, maybe we could reduce them by one or, or combine all of them. You know, take Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas and make one sizable holiday. We could say, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa! <laughs> Have yourself a happy Hanukkah's I'm dreaming of a wife Hanukkah's eh? I'm rambling, right? Thank you, Will. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next up we have a scene from a play called Pizza Man by Darlene Craviotto. Julie is played by Chastity Lachey and Alice by Ashley Ashmore. These two very different women are very close friends and they're just, you know, trying to sort through life. <laughs> you know what our problem is? We're not men. Men can be angry anytime they want. Nobody cares. But if a woman even raises her voice, she's a bitch. A real ball buster. It's all right for a man to be angry. He can be aggressive and let it out. Get into a fight. Maybe I should just go out and get picked up. That won't help. All you'll do is lay there. Why? No, it's the truth. Women just lay there. That's not aggressive. Let's call a guy and get him over here. And then what? A little wine, a little music, and then we jump on him. We're going to do this? Yes. You and me? Yes. <laughs> It'll never work. Well, we can try. I don't do too well just laying there. Lying. No, honest. Now you want me to be an active participant? I've only seen one porno movie in my life. I'm not so innocent. I was married, you know. Not that I'm counting, but don't you think you've had enough? Not yet. I still remember my name. You'll get another job, Julie. Don't worry about it. Sure I will. I always do. But I hate the kind of jobs that I end up getting. I can check at work and see if there's an opening. I'm tired of jobs that don't lead anywhere. Three months waitressing at Denny's, four months selling handbags at the May Company, three weeks at the Liberace Mansion as a tour guide. Now that sounds fun. I almost lasted a year at the Hungarian Pin Factory. 
You worked at a Hungarian pen factory? I was a receptionist. We sold pens over the phone. To Hungarians? No, not Hungarians, to anybody. Were they Hungarian pens? They were made in Japan. You sold Japanese pens in a Hungarian pen factory? God, I hated that job. I'm not sure I understand this job. The salesmen were all pigs. My boss was a pig. He used to come over and sit on top of my desk. Just sit there and peer down my blouse. Two feet away from the coffee machine and he'd ask me to get up and fix him a coffee. I'd say to him, Why was it called Hungarian if they sold Japanese? It was owned by Hungarians. Got it. Go on. So I'd say to him, Mommy, can't you get your own? Hold it. I'm sorry. Mommy? His name was Mummy. This man, your boss, was named Mummy? Right. And he was Hungarian. French Moroccan. Julie, are you making this up? How could I make up something like this? This is my life, Alice. This has been my life for the last 10 years. My God, Julie, no wonder you're drinking. I'm unskilled. I'm untrained. I have no direction in my life. I'm totally unprepared for the real world. All right, so what kind of work are you interested in? I don't know. What did you want to be when you were a little girl? I don't want to talk about it. It's embarrassing. You can tell me. It sounds awful. I won't tell anybody. Come on, please. What did you want to be as a girl? A wife, a mother. Me too. Oh, ladies, beautiful. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, next up, uh, from the Pulitzer Prize winning play Proof by David Auburn. We find two sisters, never very close, dealing with the death of their father, who was once a brilliant mathematician. Kathy is played by Rebecca Allen. She lived with him and took care of him. Claire, played by Melanie Berman, had moved to New York long before and is now back for the funeral. Both sisters trying to sort out what to do next. How are you? How are you feeling about everything? About everything? About dad. How are you what feeling? What about him? Are you all right? Yeah, I am. Honestly? Yes. I think it was the right time. If there ever is the right time. <laughs> do you know what you want to do now? No. Do you want to stay here? I don't know. Do you want to go back to school? I haven't thought of Well, there's a lot to think about. How do you feel? Physically? Great. Except my hair is kind of unhealthy. I wish there was something I could do about that. Catherine. What is the point of all these questions? Katie. Policemen came to the house last night. This morning, they came again. Yeah? They said they were checking up on things here, seeing how everything was last night. That was nice. <laughs> they said that they responded to a call with an emergency last night and came to the house. Yeah? Did you call the police last night? Yeah. Why? I was trying to get this guy. Who? I thought the house was being robbed. But it wasn't. No, I changed my mind. First, you call 911 with an emergency and then you change your mind? I didn't really want them to come. So why did you call? I was trying to get this guy out of the house. Who? How? Oh, one of Dad's students. Dad hasn't had any students for years. No, he was Dad's student. Now he's he's a mathematician. 
why was he here in the first place? Well, he's trying to look at Dad's notebooks. Notebooks? In the middle of the night? It was late. I was waiting for him to finish, but last night I was sure she was stealing one of them. Stealing the notebook? Yes. So I told him to go. Was he stealing them? Yes. That's why I called the police. What's this man's name? How? Uh, Harold. Harold Dobbs. So the police said you were the only one here. Well, he left before they got here. With the notebook? No, Claire, don't be stupid. There are over a hundred notebooks, but he was only stealing one. And he was stealing it so he could bring it back to me. And I, but I let him go so that he could go play with his band on the north side. His band? He was late. He asked me if I wanted to come with him and I was like, yeah, right. Is Harold Dobbs your boyfriend? No. Are you sleeping with him? Oh, no, what? He's a math geek. And he's in a band, a rock band. No, a marching band. He plays the trombone. Yes, a rock band. I'm sorry, don't get upset. I'm just trying to understand. Is, is Harold Dobbs- Stop saying Harold Dobbs. Is this person- Harold Dobbs exists. I'm sorry, I, I just don't understand. I mean, if you had called the police last night because some creepy grad student was trying to steal some of dad's papers, I would understand. And if you were out here partying with your boyfriend, I'd understand, but the two stories just don't go together. It's because you made up the boyfriend story. I was here alone. Harold Dobbs wasn't here. No. Yes, he was here, but we weren't partying. The police said you were abusive. They said that you're lucky they didn't haul you in. Those guys were assholes, Claire. They wouldn't leave. They wanted me to fill out a report. Were you abusive? They were trying to come into my house. You used the word dickhead? Oh, I don't remember. That's what they said. Well, not with that phrasing. Oh my god, did you strike one of them? They were trying to come into the house. Oh my god. I may have pushed one a little. They said you were either drunk or disturbed. They were trying to come into my house. You called them. Yes, but I didn't actually want them to come and they did come. And they they acted like they owned the place, pushing me around, calling me girly, laughing. They were assholes. These guys seemed perfectly nice. They took the time when they were off duty at the end of their shift to come back here and check up on things. They were very polite. Well, people are nicer to you. Fantastic. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. Um, great. This brings us to about the halfway point in our program today. And I am thrilled to be joined by Dean Wright. Melissa, this is just wonderful. It's what a fun afternoon break this has been uh, for me and I know for everybody watching. Uh, you're doing really great work with these students. Great. Well, we have some really talented young artists, don't we? We sure do. We sure do. Melissa, I had a, a few questions I wanted to ask you before we get back into the performances. Um, a couple of things that I was, I was wondering about. Um, can you talk about some of the recent successes that some of our uh, vocalists have had and maybe how some of that uh, acting training has helped them? Um, anybody come to mind? I'd be happy to. You know, um, singers are asked to do a lot more now in the modern world. And um, one, in fact, one of the actors, um, uh, I, I call them actors. I know they're singers, but, you know, I call them actors. One of our t performers today, Chastity um, Lachey Walker, she was a finalist in this year's Met competition in New York just before the shutdown. Um, and we have, we've been so lucky that some of our recent grads have been able, been accepted into Marilla. I know that Nicola Prince was accepted for this year, although this year was canceled. Um, prior, we had Edward Lawrenson who went through that program. And then now I think he's a young artist in the young artist program at 
Colorado Opera. Um, Esther Tonea um, did has done amazing things. Uh, she really she really worked very hard in the acting classes. Um, she not only she became an Adler Fellow and she was set to make her main stage uh, debut in Arnani this fall uh, at the Opera. It's going to be directed by our very own Jose Maria uh, Condemi. Um, Natalie Image is another one. She came in and she took every acting class she could possibly take. Uh, she went through Merola and an Adler Fellow, and she's also doing great. Um, we have several other SFCM grads who are working all over the place, and we have a number in the SFO Opera Chorus. Uh, the most recent for the full-time tenure track chorus position is Wilford Kelly and um, Camille Sherman and Ricky Garcia are both at the Portland Opera Young Artist Program. So um, good on our training because they are really doing great really knocking the ball out of the park as they say yes. it's I'm, I'm always so impressed and you know one of the reasons i got the idea for this particular program was i was able to join you in december uh when the fall semester ended and heard some of the uh, monologues and scenes there and i was just so impressed with the work that you're doing with the students and i thought we've got to share this with the, the greater community and people from around the world uh, and how amazing that we have people from from istanbul to christchurch new zealand and uh, Mississippi and Ohio and several here in San Francisco. It's amazing. Uh, I, another question I had for you, for the young vocalists out there that are maybe in high school and looking to come to a conservatory and potentially even the SFCM, what advice do you have for them uh, to begin some of their acting training? Oh, that is such a great question because we can, as young artists, I know I certainly did, we get, we can think, oh, voice, voice, voice. But in the modern world, uh, the singers really do need to have, bring it all, bring it all. So jumping into, in addition to the vocal training and the musician trip training, jumping into acting training of any sort. Now, it doesn't have to be acting for singers. It will just get you going and learning how to use your body and your voice to express the full character because ultimately we're looking to embody that character in all ways beyond just the gorgeous singing. So that physicality on stage and learning how to use text to communicate character and improv class is another great thing. It can be quite fun, but it's really designed uh, so that we can learn how to make choices, to be spontaneous and to feel empowered in our work without waiting to sit back and you know have somebody tell us it's the right thing to do because singers do need to be quite bold um, of course i always recommend that singers take as much dance class as they can not just because we use it on stage but because dance is an opportunity to learn how to use the music itself to express with your body some sort of emotion or thought or feeling so all of which uh, in whatever source you can find it, wherever you are locally, um, helps to build the complete singing actor, which is really where we are headed today in the 21st century. Yeah, we really, really are. And you're doing great work. Um, well, let's, uh, let's get back into it. I'll turn it over to you to introduce the next group. Uh, Melissa, I'll talk to you at the top of the hour. Okay, sounds good. All right. Now, to get us back into the swing of things, uh, we are going to have a monologue from Christina Lance, uh, from a play called The Doomsday Club, and the character is Sheila. I think Sheila has some stuff that she would like to tell us. Oh, here she comes. Dr. Lang told me that under hypnosis, I confessed that my parents' bowling league was just a cover for one of the Midwest's largest satanic cults. <laughs> of which my father was the leader. Well, after that, of course, I became a therapy junkie. I saw my doctor twice a day and was on the phone with her on weekends. Every dream was a new revelation. Every revelation brought new understanding. You wouldn't believe what a mind can hide. But for the first time in my life, I was happy. At least I thought I was. I mean, if you're gonna be addicted to something, it might as well be self-discovery, right? <laughs> Except it turned out that my unconscious wasn't really trying to communicate with me at all. Dr. Lang was arrested for insurance fraud. 
they said that she'd been programming all of her patients to believe that they were cult victims. <laughs> well, there's a lot of money in it, you know, because cult victims need therapy for at least the rest of their lives. You know, as for my parents, they weren't really Satanists at all. Just really, really bad bowlers. Great. Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> Great. Uh, our next scene is from a play called Reasons to be Pretty by Neil LeBute. Uh, Greg, played by Will O'Brien, still in New Zealand, and Carly, played by Katie Almond. These are co-workers. Carly is friends with Greg's girlfriend. Greg and his girlfriend have had a terrible fight. Lights up on the break room. It's Poe. I don't know who that is. Oh. Well, it's pretty dark. Yeah, well, it's night out. Right. No, I meant, what do you- So, like? it's gonna be, you know, dark. Yep, it's true. That's why they call it that. What? Call what that? Night. Oh. Because it gets dark at night, so. Is that why? I believe so. Huh. You know, that doesn't really make any sense. No. I mean, not really. They could call it siesta and it would still be dark out, or, or raspberry, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Night doesn't have all that much to do with it. Fine! Great! I was just making conversation. Oh, thanks, officer. Look, Carly, why do you have to go do that? What? Call Steph and make some big old- I didn't do anything. Yeah, uh-huh, it's just she's- I just- You got her totally worked up, okay? And now she's completely pissed. I can't even get her to take my- I'm sorry, but she called me. So you're the one with the problem, obviously. What? She said stuff to me about you. Not very nice stuff either. She talks shit on you if you really want to know, okay? Great. Yeah, lots of shit and cried a little. Oh, come on. I'm not kidding. I'm not making stuff up to delight and entertain you. Your girlfriend cried on the phone to me. And it doesn't matter who called who, it doesn't. She's upset because of the things you've said about her. Thing, one thing I said, okay? And it wasn't meant to be some, God, why'd you have to tell her, huh? Why? Why'd you say it right back at you, okay? Why would you ever say a thing like that about someone? I'm sorry, but nobody, no, Buddy, not even the most clueless of guys is going to make that kind of a mistake. You were being honest. No, I, it wasn't meant to be. I was saying a loving thing. I was. Oh, really? Yeah, in, in a, you know, roundabout kind of way. Well, I'd send flowers next time instead, maybe. Because your communication skills suck. Fine. The message was lost. Oh, whatever. Yeah, whatever is right. Oh, okay. Look, just don't don't look so triumphant or whatnot, okay? Do not. God, you guys love it when we do crap like this. And what crap is that? Hmm? Oh, you know, screw up. So you acknowledge it then? Yes, of course. Look, I said that to her. I said I'm sorry, at least. I think I said, I'm sorry. I don't remember now. Okay, she was yelling. And you know how she gets. And, and there was swearing and... Look, we said stuff, okay? But I'm sure... Yeah, I, I think I said... Forgive me or something. Well, I'll ask her. What's that mean? I'm saying, when she calls next, I will ask if that is what you did. So, so what? She's not coming home now? This is it? I don't know. Is that what you told her to do, huh? No. Shit. 
Hey, don't swear at no, me. No, seriously, hey. Carly, this is like a bunch of BS, and don't do that to me, okay? Don't get Greg, her all. Don't start. Tell me what else you said. No, Greg. Say it. I want you to tell me. No. Come on. Don't. Wow. Thank you, you two. That was fantastic. Thank you, you two. Greg and Carly. Okay. Ah, uh, in our next scene from a play called Daylight and Boonville by Matt Williams, we find two wives in a strip mining town waiting for news about their husbands. There was an explosion in the mine and they're sitting on the porch waiting. Christina Young plays Marlene and Kaylee Milterson is Carla. The women who are longtime friends in this very small town manage their anxiety in really different ways. Oh, I just love these stories about these stars in my movie magazines. I'm sick of those stupid stories. They're not stupid. I don't want to hurt your feelings, Marlene, but those magazines are junk. <gasps> Trash junk. They are not. Lots of people read them. Only stupid people read that kind of stuff. Are you saying I'm stupid? No. Yes, you are. Okay, Marlene, you're stupid. Stupid for reading that garbage. God, I should have gotten out of here so long ago. If you're really going to leave, you would have gone a long time ago. I will. You don't really want to leave here. It's just talk, just excuses. You'll never leave here. Never. I swear I will. Then go. Go. But you ain't gonna find nothing better than what you got right here. I got nothing. And I am meant for more than this. More than what? There can't be more than your family. That's the most important thing in the world. Oh, crap. That is a bunch of crap. It is not. Stacy and Larry love you and they need you. They don't need me. Stacy ain't needed me since she learned how to walk. And Larry sure as hell don't. You don't wanna face the fact that you love Larry, don't you? Cause you're afraid if you do, it'll keep you from finding your destiny or whatever it is you're looking for. Well, I got news for you. You don't find happiness. You create it. I mean, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? I thought I was your friend. You're nothing but an old breed dog for Big Jim. Don't talk about Big Jim. You sit around all day reading your magazines, waiting for Big and Jim to come home. He is my husband. I love him. No, you worship him. Just because you're unhappy, don't oh, start wait. in on, we got something special no one can take no, away. Open your eyes. We need each other and that's Why? special. He's special and he is no, my I husband. Wanda. That is a lie. I didn't mean to, it just came out. It is a lie. I'm sorry, Marlene, but it's not a lie. It is a lie. You ever wonder why he don't touch you no more? Why he ain't laid a hand on you in months? I'm pregnant. That's an excuse, cause he's seen Wanda. Lie for months. Liar. Marlene. Lie. You're sleeping together. Lie, 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 lie. It's the truth, Marlene. I wanted to tell you, but I, I didn't want it to come out like this. You were always so happy, but You've got to face the facts. He is a man. He is not some sort of God. You've got to realize that. And even though I wanted you to know, I hoped you'd never find out. 
They've been together for months. Ever since her husband died. Before that. What? Jim was seeing her before her husband died. You knew? You knew about them? From the start. All this time, and you knew? Yes, Carla, I knew. Why? Why did you act like you didn't know? Because I don't want to lose what I got. My family, my husband, my children, that's all I got. All I ever wanted. I'd rather go on pretending I didn't know than lose the only thing that I got. I didn't know. Don't. Marlene, I'm sorry. Just let me alone. Why didn't you tell me? I want to go inside. Marlene, I love you. No, I haven't said that before ever, I know. But it's the truth. You know that, don't you? It's getting late. I need to start supper. I understand now. I do. Just let me alone. Oh, ladies, fantastic. Wonderful work. Thank you so much for that. Okay, and now for some, a little change of pace. Uh, next up, Kimberly Lehman will be doing a monologue from a play called A Roz by Any Other Name by B.T. Rybeck. Okay, so uh, Rosalind was supposed to marry uh, this guy called Romeo, but he dumped her at a party for some chick named Juliet. Oh my God. Vera, 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 I just, I mean, who does he think he is? Who does he think I am? I've been sitting all night, Vera. I don't think I'll ever need to sit again after tonight, waiting for that stupid, stubborn. Ugh, I'm sweating, Vera. Look at me sweat. I never sweat. I hate sweating. This is anchor sweat. And, and he never asked for one dance. After all I did for him, all the time we shared, he acted like I wasn't even there. The nerve he has. Did he think that no one would see? Did he think I wouldn't see? I sat there all night waiting for him to ask me to dance. I ought to tell his parents. <laughs> his mother would die right on the spot if I marched up to her and said, Lady Montague, do you know who I saw your Romeo locking lips with all night long? That's right, milady. Juliet Capulet. Capulet! <laughs> she would die on the spot. I just, I don't understand. A Capulet! I mean, it's one thing to see manure on the street, but to actually pick it up and bring it home with you? But then what can one expect from a mule? But honestly, a Capulet, to go from a Constantini to a Capulet. Even alphabetically, it's backwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> okay. Next, in a very bittersweet vignette called Where It Went from the play Almost Maine, uh, we meet Chris Mars, played by Christina Lance, and Phil, played by Kurt Winterhalter. They're a married couple for whom things haven't been going so well. Uh, so they decided to have a date night ice skating. It still feels like you're mad. I'm not mad. I just but said you I were, wish you'd pay more attention. You are. You're mad. I'm not mad. I was having fun, I thought. I had fun tonight. Did you? Yeah. Good.
I mean, Chad called me into the mill. I had to work. I'm not mad at you, Phil. You had to work. I did. Phil, where's my shoe? I, I can't find it. Well, it's got to be here. Is this you being funny? No. Because it's not funny. It's I... cold out here. Well, you're the one that wanted to go skating. Phil. We'll find it. All right? It's got to be here. I I'm not mad. I was never mad. I was disappointed, but Mars. I'm done now. I had fun tonight. Skating. I thought it would be fun. It was. Get us away from all the stuff. Get us back to what we used to be. We went skating. The first time you kissed me. Remember? On a Friday night, just like this one. Right here. Echo Pond. I know where we are. Okay, where the heck is your shoe? Okay, maybe it's in the car. Where'd you put your skates on? Out here in the car. I put them on with you. Right here. Well, it's oh. not in the car. Oh, whoa. Shooting star. Shooting star. What? Where? Where? Mark, Shh. where? I'm wishing. I'm wishing. Ah. Uh, I missed it. Yeah, you did. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. It's just not all that surprising that you didn't what? see it. What? The shooting star. Why? Because you don't pay attention, Phil. See, when you say things like that, I feel like you're still mad. I'm not. Mars. I wasn't mad. Where is my shoe? Maybe it is in the car. I mean, I know I didn't put my skates on the car because the shoe I have on already was out there. I put my shoes on out there with you, didn't I? Phil? God, this is the weirdest thing. Well, it's not in the car. I mean, what's wrong? Huh? Oh, uh, I'm, uh, Making a wish of my own, um, on a regular one. Oh. Uh, do you want to wish on it with me? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. Which one? Um, see, uh, Hedgehog Mountain? Uh-huh. Uh, straight up. Right above it. The bright one? Yeah. That one? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Phil. Yeah? That's a planet. What? That's a planet. You're wishing on a planet. That's a... what? Yeah, and it's hey, well, when you, you know? wish upon a star, not when you wish upon a I planet. I know, I know. How star. do you know? I saw it on the news, Phil. They've been saying all week Saturn's the brightest object in the sky this month, and it's going to be sitting right above Hedgehog Mountain for the next bunch of weeks. And your wish is never going to come true if you're wishing on a planet. Well, I mean, I guess... Uh... You gotta pay attention! Why do you keep saying that? What? That I gotta pay attention. Cause you don't. What are you talking about? Phil! What? Happy anniversary! Huh? Happy anniversary. That's what I'm talking about. I knew you were mad. 
I'm not mad. You're mad at me, and pretty soon, out of nowhere, no. it's gonna get ugly. I. I wasn't mad. I mean, I'm Marsh, just... I'm sorry. All right, I, I know I missed some things, but I gotta work. I gotta take a double when Chad needs me at the mill. He's helping me. He's helping us out, you know. Offered me the overtime. I know. I know. No, you don't know. All right, me working is for us, and it's for the kids. And it's a lot sometimes, and it messes me up. Phil, I'm not mad about you working. I understand that. What I don't understand is why I'm lonely, Phil. I got a husband and a couple of great kids. And I'm lonely. You just, you go away. I don't know where you go, but you go somewhere where you can't pay attention and you forget your anniversary. I mean, I brought you out here hoping you would remember about us, but you didn't. And that makes me so mad. I, I don't know what to do anymore. You lie. What? You lie so bad. What? You're mad at me, but you don't tell me even when I ask you over and over and over. Because you wouldn't pay attention even <laughs> no, if I did No, 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 it's because you don't know how to tell me what you feel like about me anymore, so I never know where I am or where I stand. You know, maybe that's why I go away, so I can know where I am for a second. I, I... And you know what? It's lonely there too, where I go. And you sent me there. You went away a long time before I did it. And now all you do is lie. I don't lie. Yes, you do. You say you're not mad, but you're mad. You say you had fun, but you didn't. You, you didn't have fun tonight, did you? No. But you kept saying you did. I didn't. I didn't have fun, Phil. I don't have fun with you anymore. Did you? No. I had a rotten, lousy time. Well then. What are we doing? What are we waiting for? Thank you too. That was absolutely fantastic. Really terrific. Thank you too. Okay. We are going to end today with a scene from a 2016 play called The Anthropology Section by Patricia Cotter. Rebecca Allen will be playing Marion and Rachel Nelson will be playing Tessa. We have two exes meeting each other in the anthropology section of the bookstore. So I'm starting a trombone choir. So that's happening. Great, that's really great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know you've been talking about doing that for a long time. Yeah, it has been a long time coming. <laughs> you cut your bangs. Yeah, well, I didn't exactly cut them myself. I mean, no, of course not. I mean, well, I watched a YouTube video, so, you know, I had some help, but. Oh. I, I think they're, uh, they're looking better, you know, now that they've sort of settled in. I can see that, yeah, they're settling in nicely. Well, you know, I just, I figured, how hard could it be? You know, it turns out there is a pretty large amount of skill involved. Who knew? Probably most people, but I admire you for trying. It is wild to see you again. It is. 
sort of couldn't believe it when I saw you poking through the anthropology section. <laughs> well, I, you know, I love anthropology. You look great, Tessa. Thanks. I mean, you look amazing. <laughs> I don't think that's true, but thank you. You look better than you've ever looked. You look better than you have ever looked in the history of you. I did just get a facial. No, no, it's something, you look different. You are very tan. I just got back from Barcelona. Oh, nice. I, uh, uh, did you, did you go with anyone or? Yeah, I went with someone. Um, I actually went for my, <laughs> okay. I went to Spain for my honeymoon. I got married. You got married? Yes, I went to Barcelona with my wife. Wife? What? Nothing. Why a face? Why a face when I say I have a wife, Marion? I don't see how that information requires a face. I had nothing, I said nothing. It's just, you know, I don't really get the whole wife thing. I knew it. I knew it. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I regretted telling you. You can't get mad at me because I'm married. I'm not mad at you because... Okay, I might be a little mad at you because of that, but it's... It's bigger than that. It's just so... All right, are you ready? Because I'm going to say it. Heteronormative. I'm only letting you use that word on me because we're standing in anthropology. Personally, I don't have a problem with expectations or things normative. It's just a word and we claimed it. It's not a big deal. Your grandfather had a wife, your dad, every president except for maybe Taft or wait, McKinley? It's Buchanan. He's probably gay. Whatever. The point is, they all had a wife. No, I have one. I have a wife. I am a wife. It's equal. We're the same, as good as, as equal to. I wanted it. I didn't know that I felt less than until I didn't feel it anymore. And that, Marion, is basically it. What? Okay, what is this? No. Just, no. Tessa, mm. would you, I, okay, I mean, would you have married me if I had asked you to? I'm not 100% sure what's happening right now. I'm proposing. This is retroactively. I am already married. No, this is a past tense hypothetical proposal. You should really- Tessa. Tessa. Would you have spent the rest of your life with me? Would you have cherished having to hold me uh, sickness and health? in, oh, uh, home bang trims and $150 haircuts uh, till death, or you happen to meet someone else that you love more and you blow a shit ton of money on a European destination wedding, did us part. Please get up. I'm really gonna need an answer here. I probably would have said yes. I also think that we would be in the same exact place we're in today. Cause you love her more. Because I love her different. Why? Never in a million years would she even think to start a trombone choir. I know we can't go back. We go forward. Even if it means we lose some things. Okay. I'm gonna leave you in anthropology now. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Let's bring the curtain down today on our special Tiny Dorm Concert Acting Class Edition. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And I believe Dean Wright is going to be uh, joining me in a second here. Uh, Great work, Melissa. Boy, it was really, what an entertaining hour it was. I'm so glad that we did this. Great. I'm so glad we were able to share it. Great. Hey, I, a couple of thanks I want to get out, and then we'll close the show out. 
Um, I want to thank again our supporter, uh, Harry Winston, for all of the support and longstanding commitment that they've provided us, the donors out there, the board of trustees, uh, the students for sticking with us through a difficult term, but making the best of it, like all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to thank the SFCM recording department, uh, Jason O'Connell, who's on this call, and uh, that whole staff and team, Kelly Coyne and uh, Torin and Mary Claire and the whole group, just really appreciative of all of the work you all have done, the student workers. And, um, you know, Melissa, of course, if people like this to now, we have a, a great closing tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, the opera department is gonna be doing scenes from the operas that we weren't able to perform this semester. People should tune in for that. I'll give you a chance for the closing remarks. Great, I will be there to see the opera and the musical theater department concert. That's at seven o'clock tonight, everybody. Um, let's get all of our performers back on screen so that we can give them a proper virtual uh, Zoom bow. Oh, look, there they are. Bravi tutti. Ah, woohoo, woohoo. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's been great. It's been our pleasure to share the work with you.